Okay, so what I'm going to present is OpenFPM, that is a scalable C++ library for particle mesh simulation. Now I have to in any way say a disclaimer, so because this one is unofficial mosaic presentation, whatever I say is my responsibility, does not have to go to the mosaic group, okay? So it's just on me. Now, to be fair, uh, I have to anyway mention that there was a Fortran uh, uh, particle mesh uh, library that was developed by all supervisor, actually my employee <laughs> now. And uh, because we wanted new specification, new goal, we decided to reconstruct a new C++ scalable uh, uh, particle mesh library. For, uh, some library for particle mesh simulation. So new, new, new specification require completely restart from scratch. So what well, first keyword is simulation. What, what first I mean, because I don't know the audience what I mean with that. I mean the attempt to emulate a physical process on a computer. So here we see like a fluid that hit an obstacle or here uh, reaction diffusion simulations, so chemistry. Here is a discrete element matter, so granular flow, granule that, that move in industry is quite used to simulate transportation process of granular material. And here are uh, vortex rings. If you ever saw this uh, vortex ring that move, uh, smoking vortex that move, uh, remain ring and at some point uh, the, the dissolve. This is a simulation that emulate that process that a vortex rings move, then at some point became unstable and become going to turbulent regimes and it dissolves. So how this process of simulations more or less uh, happen, work? Now in a cartoon, you have a physical process that in this case, I just use a vortex ring, just in the moment to become unstable and go into turbulence regime. And w when, when it does that, you could use this, uh, this, uh, this, this pattern. And in general, what happens is that there is either a physicist or a mathematician that produce a mathematical model, an equations or some other stuff. And uh, well, in general, now that you have a mathematical problem, you have to prove that this mathematical model actually represents your, your experiment. So what you have to do is to try to solve this find an exact solution for this equation for your experiment. Now, unfortunately, I find an exact solution is most of the time um, impossible, is so most of the time unsolvable with exception of few cases. So what we can do is that you go back, you relax these things of finding an exact solution, you find an approximate solution. So approximate solution means a solution where you have an error, but you can control the error. And so if you can control and you can get an error that is small enough, you can find a, a, a solution that is still approximate, but still solve your problem. So it, it is good enough to represent your experiment that you did. Okay? So, and this one more or less open to a completely new field, that is the numerical methods that is exactly the attempt to solve in a numerical way, you know, in an approximate way, this uh, mathematical model. Now, numerical methods are more or less algorithm, and uh, algorithm that um, transform a lot of flops, a lot of use a lot of flops, a lot of number. And because of that, theory is where the computer comes in. I'm sorry if it's boring for someone that already know this thing, but because I didn't know the audience. I decided to put this one. And because you have algorithm, more or less, you also have uh, data structure. You, you, you need data structure. Now, uh, what are data structure for simulation? Well, uh, we, we live in a 3D reality. So the data structure that you need are more or less data structure that map from, from map the information into your 3D space most of the time. So more or less information, if a general data structure has information, this information most of the time has to be um, uh, geolocalized in, 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 the three, in a 3D space, more or less. 
in numerical method, this is called in general discretization. But most of the time, you try to uh, put information in in a 3D space. Now, I cannot say, but uh, cannot, but you have to believe that in, it's true that we live in 3D. But most of the time, there are physical processes that has to be st studied even a lower dimension or even at higher dimension. Just to say two simple examples of structure for, or data structure that um, can be used for simulation. Let's suppose that you have an SD vector of objects, like a list. And this does not contain any information of, of the space. But if you just introduce a float x2, and we say this is indicate what is the positional information of this object, we have more or less object in a 2D space. And actually, this is a just particle. So second keyword done, more or less. Another simple example of what we mean for mapping from, from a, a data structure into an n-dimensional space, consider just a multidimensional array. It's a 2D array. Just introduce a spacing, 0 0.2. And this just define a grid 5 by 5 between 0 and 1. Pretty simple and obvious. So what is about OpenFPM is a, a library that want to provide data structure to write simulation algorithm in n dimension, in general, not in, only in 3D, but in n dimension in general. What are the challenges for this and what, are, what, what they try to do? Well, we want to have a library that is able to scale. Scaling means that we want that this library is able to scale on all the computational resources that you have. So we want that work. Uh, this data structure work on one computer, like on 100 computer. And we also want data structure that are quite flexible based on what are your algorithm specification. I'm going more in detail later on on this one. And also that structure that work on CPU, but even on GPU. The concept is having data structure in which the user can code its own numerical method, its own algorithm, its own simulation, without mainly, mainly focus on the algorithm implementation, without focusing too much on, on this concept, hiding this, this, this problem. There's quite a lot of time. It's, they are extremely time consuming. So how I, you can create, now here I did, uh, so how you can create this kind of data structure? So first of all, data structure require memory. Of course, they contain information. So well, you can start from, from the fact that you can create small objects like heap memory, which you can allocate a thousand bytes, and you can get the pointer, or then you reside the memory, the heap memory, or you can eventually copy from, from another memory. Just, just, just a simple object to create memory, to store information. Like you want to, on heap memory, you can also decide to have it on GPU, so also on CUDA memory, same, same, same interface. Now, already at this level, what I do is that to create already this dualism between host memory and device memory. I don't know if you ever code in CUDA, but most of the way to accelerate, uh, most of the API that require to accelerate code, you, you have to actually have, you have these dual things of having host memory and device memory. Uh, for this reason, we have also an interface that get also the device pointer, a pointer to the device memory, and also that transfer memory from the device to host or from the host to, to the device. Now, once that you have memory allocation, you have to, to shape it. And what we mean with shaping means that we have bytes, we have to give some meaning to them. So the first, uh, the first thing is that we can try to have a multidimensional array that is a kind of very simple basic data structure to already give some more shape to the 1D array byte that you have out of that object that just create memory. And well, you can allocate 4,000 by, you get the pointer. And I don't know if you ever try to use multi-dimensional array in Boost, um, in particular multi-dimensional. 
uh, more disclaimer on this code. I, in general, I simplify the code for, 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 for the sake of simplicity. So it does not try to compile this and is not going to compile. Okay, so uh, these are way to shape. So more or less what you give is that you give a pointer, or you give the dimension of your 3D, 3, uh, 3D array or three-dimensional array, and then you just use in, in, in like a normal 3D static array. I cheated a little bit because actually it's a little bit more complicated because you can have also an ordering uh, parameter in this boost multidimensional array that, that uh, shape your memory. And let's see what it does. So now you, you know that on, on C++, when you have a multidimensional array, static multidimensional array, no? Here, here is the runtime, but just think on, on, on a static way. We know that the address of the element 0, 0, 0 is at 0, x, 0, 0, s of set. And 0, 0, 1 is at just 4 bytes after, while 1, 0, 0 is at 190, uh, 190 in hexadecimal, so 400 byte more. But this is one of the things that we can say is that the order of this of this indexing. So, for example, if I now choose order 1 to 0, I still address in this way, but now how the, how the indexes are mapped into memory is different because 0, 0, 0 is still at 0, 0, but I flip 1 on 2. So, 0, 0, 1 now is at fo offset 400, while 1, 0, 0 is at offset 4. So, we have a flexibility to have a map between indexing and, and memory. Now, let me also go a little bit more because I tune it for my cases. Now, because here you have most, a lot of time we have, uh, so in, in the previous one, I give all the dimension in at runtime, no? because they are given here and then we are given to this, to this, uh, to this constructor. But um, um, a lot of time can also happen that I have the knowledge of the size of ARI in some part at compile time and in some part at runtime. So it just created just more structure in which you can give also for, for my uh, purpose, in which you, you can give the uh, dimension in, uh, in, uh, in, in, at compile time and this minus one, it say that the first one is, is given at runtime, given by this parameter S zeta 10. You still have the order, so it's, it's exactly the same as before. Now let's see, uh, uh, for, for simplicity, I just use this mass. I just say in this, I just will uh, use this notation, a multidimensional array in this way. When you will see this one, just consider that it's not a simple C static array, but it's just these more complicated things that give you exactly this freedom that the normal C array don't, don't, don't give it to you. This one are compile time and this one is runtime. In this case, I have only one runtime and I will show you why, why you just need only one runtime index at the end. Now let's put, go on, on more on toward the simulation of the structure. Now let's suppose you just want to have a grid where you have on each point a vector. That's more or less is toward the discretization of the vector field. So what I have as a prototype, I can also do the sides. Uh, I just put the sides of a grid and I have a grid data structure, two is dimension two. Aggregate is like a tuple or a boost fusion vector. I don't know if everybody know about that, is uh, more or less think uh, in a way that is a way to define a structure with these things inside or more or less whatever you put in your tuple inside. And uh, let's suppose that you address in this way, gr, i, j, because you have, uh, you can select one of these points and then you have the k that is more or less the component of the velocity. Um, more or less, now we have these things, uh, so how we can map on the previous one is that we can select one index, k, that is equal to i multiplied 10 plus j, and j map onto a float array 102. Um, we also have more flexibility. 
So if you have a tuple that has multiple one, we have a possibility to have a layout selection in which you can, in this case, you have one parameter more because you can, like, can select either the first one, either the second one property. I, J are, you select the point and K, S are more or less this index here when you select this, the property, this is the property zero, this is the property one, K, S, just then you have two index to select uh, which component of this tensor in theory is called. This thing gives you a possibility to more or less uh, define, you, you still address in the same way, but it gives you a, exactly again the possibility to control the layout of the data structure. So you can, with uh, one parameter, have an array of structs, so more or less uh, an array of aggregate of float 2 and float 5, or you have a structure of array, so a float array 102, uh, so each property map into uh, uh, an array. This is quite useful in case you want to use GPUs. So that's also bring back to the concept of having data structures that work in which you can control the layout in order to, 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 to also make it suitable for GPUs computation. So not only that you can offload of the memory, but also you can control the memory layout. So in a recap, uh, more or less, you have a data structure in which exactly in a modular way, we have several different modules you can control where it is stored in memory, we can control structure of array or array of structure. Or we can also control more in general how this complex data structure, more complex data structure is mapped into, into, into memory. Small, small, small things, a grid in one dimension is equivalent to more or less a vector. So we, now we say how we can construct single core data structure. More or less in here I'm going to, to, to the design. Uh, now how we can construct the distributed data structure, what we, what, what we need, which kind of other module we need. We, we, we always want to compare, to create small compartments, so modularization of each component in order to have, uh, to, 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 really, to really maintain the cost of, of coding low. So in order to do it, I have to go uh, on, on the side of which kind of speci specification we need for, for this distributed data structure. Now we already saw the simulation, two typical simulation data structure. One is the particle and the other one is the mesh that in this case is just like a grid. Now, what we can do to make it distributed? Well, to make it distributed, we can, we can, so if you think that you have a simulation domain, the most obvious things is to decompose and divide the simulation domain. So more or less you say, one processor, one machine, or one core, or one GPU, or whatever the, uh, computational device take one part of the space of a simulation domain, another computation, uh, another computation proce processor, or whatever, take another part of the space, and another take another part of the space. So for example, what did it, what it happen on the previous one, a particle set and, uh, and, uh, and a grid one, is that the first one take all the particles that in this part of two-dimensional space, the other take uh, the processor in blue take this part and, 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 and the green one take this part. Same things for the grid, it doesn't change anything. To note that, of course, if, because now I'm going on simulation, not anymore on data structure, I also introduce the concept of space. No? And so in this case, I have to give the space and also the precision which all the space calculation happen. So, and given this data structure, what you can do is that, well, how, how parallelization work? Well, the, the thing is that you can construct some, some loops and the loops only split automatically the computation on, on its own local data. So each processor split its, the loop to run on each own local data. So if I write on C++ these things, uh, that is a loop across all the domain iterator because I, I do it to, to simplify, uh, it, it, it is a loop that go across all the um, point, 
that, that you have, what, what it happened is that the processor one execute this, this, this loop, but it ran the loop only on this point. The processor red take only this point, and the processor in green take only this one. And of course, you, you know, inside the loop, for every point P that you get, you, you have to access the, 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 the data that each point has. For the particle is the same. You 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 have a loops that, uh, and you can access in this case property. Let's say which 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 property and also position because the particle also has position. And uh, so, yeah. So what you need more now here are the difficulty. Um, because now all the data are divided uh, across processor, uh, well, we, we say that we have a simple way to have to split the loop, but it's quite clear that we need the communication. Most of the time, what happens is that the local information to do some computation is not enough the local information, and most of the time I have to I have to get information from, from the other processor. No. Now, because it's simulation domain, in general, all the interactions is expressed in, 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 in space. So let's suppose, for example, a typical computation that you have a particle with an interaction radius, and you have to calculate the state of this particle, and you need all the particles that surround you. Well, given this one, what you need, we need all the particles within this, uh, with this layer. And this means that you have to communicate the particle on, on the processor in blue. And this is an explicit operation that you have to do on the library, given Ghost Cat, in order where you can choose which property to communicate, because maybe to calculate the, the state of this particle, you don't need all the property, but you need only property 0 and 2, so you skip just the... Uh, the, the the property one and uh, so what I was saying yeah and you have to communicate from all the processors to the processor in in, in blue now it can also so uh, this is an explicit operation so it's something that every time you have to access this operation you have to do this cost cat is is absolutely explicit you can, unfortunately you cannot hide and is a parallelization one and it is something that you only want to do with skipping you also want to have the lowest sample so let's, let's say just use the property that you need because communication are expensive and you want to reduce them Another thing is that the uh, processor in blue can also change the, 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 the trans change something on this particle, on the ghost particle. Well, the ghost particles are not its own particle, but reside in reality in one of the neighborhood particles, in um, one of the neighborhood processors. So this, in, in this case, if you change, you have to merge here, you have to merge back to, to the uh, original processor. This goes under the operation of ghost put, in which not only you have a property, you also have an operation. Because you have to think that uh, um, a ghost particle here is replicated, can be replicated multiple times. And so uh, what you have to do is that uh, when you merge back, you can have multiple requests to change your information in one particle. So you have to say how to merge back the information. Another thing for that comes from scalability, so more or less from the, the, the distribution of the information, is the fact that consider particles that are at the border of one, one processor, so, so, because we are dividing the space. This particle can move, it can cross the, the boundary of, of, of the processor. And what we have to introduce is a function for which every time something moves, that go outside another processor, the processor map, we remap the particle to the processor that actually own this part of the space. The same things happen for, 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 for if, if the decomposition, say, the, 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 the decomposition is changing, map, map again the particle, let's say, bring the particle to the processor that actually own that part of space, this way. And if you, 
look exactly, so just to have an example, if you look at the, um, how we, 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 we create loop on this data structure, more or less the computation of each computer does is uh, linked to the, how much information that processor has. So for example, if you have a processor that has a small amount of particle, we'll have a small time, a small computation, one that has big uh, number of information, big number of particles, we have a lot, of, a lot more computation. But what you want to have perfect parallelization is that, um, is that the number of, uh, of information that, or computation that each processor has is more or less equal, otherwise you don't have perfect scaling. And to do so, you have to always adapt the decomposition in order that each processor has uh, an equal amount of, of data. And this go, go under the name of dynamic load balancing. And the, 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 the library give exactly this functionality. So exactly, we have exactly these two um, new models that now we are uh, required in order to construct our distributed uh, data structure that are the domain decomposition, the composition of a simulation domain, and also the communication part. This one I want to skip, fuck it. Uh, so uh, given also this design that, okay, also domain decomposition is based on single core data structure and communication also, so most, more or less you have the same functionality um, the, the, all these models inherit the same for lower level functionalities. For, for example, you can use a, easily does GPU direct in the communication. And this design we can also, now we are working on, uh, we, we can also show that it's more or less also enough to create more complex data structure, like AMR data structure. So more or less what you have to do here is that uh, in, the, in the single core data structure, instead of having a, a grid that is dense, you just create one that is sparse. All this module remain the same. And what you have is that instead of having one grid, you have a vector of multiple grid at different resolution. And given that, with basically you create more code because you reuse more or less the same code here, you can have adaptive resolution, adaptive grid, and AMR data structure like this one. So this is mostly developed in two months based on the code that was already there. And this is also, if, if this is also another thing that I want to advertise is if you know someone that like CUDA, like internship or a person that like to code, we have a master thesis to accelerate multi-resolution simulation on GPU. So if someone want to do it and like to do this kind of thing, we, we, we would like to have some students. So just, just contact us. And so more or less, if you, so if you do all the things all together, you get the library. What I explained is how I did it, more or less, more or less like an history of how I did this thing. And so more or less, when you have this scalable uh, data structure, you can construct your simulation. And here you see that all these are examples. So they are not taken from someone else. Are example in my library that can be downloaded and you can run on it. And you can see that more or less all of them are scalable and all of them stay in one main CPP. If you look at the number of lines, so they are pretty much simple. And in green, that is the most interesting things is that, well, if these are the line to construct the simulation that more or less to implement the algorithm. The question is that how many lines the user has to introduce in order to have it scalable, and this is just the, red, the green one. So this map, ghost cat, and all these things, this functionality, yes, are a burden that the user has to introduce, but, and also dynamic load balance is a burden, but 
well, is not that that big. The ideal one would be zero, <laughs> but uh, is is very difficult. Actually, uh, this is something. Nesrine is is working on a DSL, and possibly would make even more simpler, so that actually you can even reach even more simplified way to do simulation. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, uh, anyway, it uh, would be nice. And, uh, well, this is uh, the conclusion, and OpenFPM, I showed it, provide uh, any mesh and other structure. So, yes, uh, this is also another thing. It's not a library that gives you solver other than just example. It's not like OpenForm or ANSYS or uh, library like that. This is that you click here and there and and, and you have your solution. You have to code your numerical methods. That that's the thing. We give some. We provide some example, but but it is it is a library to consume most of the time. And we provide a compilation from source. We also have virtual machine. We install um, OpenFPM or even Docker container. But actually, this Docker container are quite nice because you can run. All on Amazon EC2 or, or cloud computing, or even Singularity. Also, this has been tested to work on Singularity. It is a typical, um, typical um, it's, let's say, methods to not run Docker, but let's say to easily convert a Docker container in such a way that you can run it on a cluster PC without that you have to install the library. That maybe could be a little bit annoying on a cluster. Let's see. Uh, can you please return to this uh, slide of the particles where you say that basically you have one computation about particles or whatever, and then these particles can move to other particles? Yeah. yeah. So if this is the case, basically we are going to say a bottleneck, so the end state that has to move from process of one to process of or from process of two to process of one or whatever. And um, so basically, how do you manage this data calls or you use functions? Yeah, exactly. So more or less, uh, this boundary means that the user, more or less, every time move a particle explicitly and say, OK, I move a particle, some particle can go in some other processor, and then you have to do a map. And but yeah. the question is, how you can maintain performance high because at the end, the, the, the logic of parallelization is that you are always working with independent. Data. You are right. The the problem. Okay. The other way is that you don't do based on on space decomposition. You're saying you're saying I have and I have a thousand particle. I put uh, I have four hundred particle. Four processor. I put hundred year, hundred year, hundred year, and hundred year. But if you do this one, the problem is that you have to do more communication because if you look at here. Uh, probably I did not explain very well, okay? So the reason why, more or less, you, you are telling me why uh, I'm doing space decomposition rather than more data decomposition. Well, because... How, how you can really maintain your performance higher? Well, because the, compu the, the reason is that the computation is always much higher than the communication. Take more time. Consider that most of the time what you do is neighborhood search, and neighborhood computation, and this in general take more time. In general, you have a loop, the Duke force calculation, no? Then you move, and then you do dot map, right? How much time does it take? This is exactly where you don't have you have performance bottleneck, no? How much does it take? If it take one percent, then the other things for communicating then you, 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 you still have a performance. As soon as the, this communication is not the bottleneck, you can still have a performance. Because the, the computation is where it's scale, it's scale because the, the loop is divided across all processors. Yeah, but at certain point, you, you would suffer it. Yes, of course, yes, of course. It does not scale to infinity. Anything, nothing scales to infinity. Because your example, you just say, OK, assume 5. Like, there are no files, but they are going to be 50% of your data. Or... Yeah, can also happen, and in this case, you don't scale. 
Yeah, in that case, you 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 have scaling software, uh, scaling problem, and you cannot do much. Can you get back to the slides where you were explaining that if a particle moves to another processor, and then you have to map it? Yeah. Because the, the particle communication is the most important, right? Yeah. yeah. And could you please um, explain this again, how do you do this? I'll do, okay, so more or less, you let's suppose that you have a procedure in your code that you do false calculation. Yeah. Then you do time integration. And you know, is one step you have time integration where you're moving the, the particle, yeah. no? And this happens. Hmm? When you, after this loop, what you do is that dot map, the, 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 this one. And if you do another loop to recalculate the forces, now this, the forces is calculated on this process because this has moved to the other one. It's more domain specific, you know. so you're... Uh, you do domain, the composite space, the composition, because it's the most optimal way. Okay. Because if you do data, look at, I don't have a, a picture, but let's suppose that you have a random particle, no? And, and uh, you can see from here, this is, you can put it really randomly. Now, if you look at the neighborhood of one prop particle that is in blue, you can have, if it's in a random way, it can also be from one processor to another processor, another processor, another processor. If you do it in a space one, this one, only see the local one. So what you want to do is you try to r reduce the, this one, this part. So the concept that actually I, I, I made in a stupid way actually because I simplify, but this domain decomposition is a little bit more complicated than actually how, how I explain. There is a lot inside. So the concept of the domain decomposition is decompose the, 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 the space in a way that one, the computation is balanced across processor. Two, the border between two processors is minimized. That's also another degree of freedom that you have to consider. And um, when you are scaling, uh, for example, um, it's it's the performance is only um, a matter when you have actually a very large number of particles. If I'm running running simulation on two particles or maybe three particles, then I think communication is more. It costs me more, and yeah. speed would not. Be yeah. No, you need a lot of particles. So. To, on, on two particles. Any? Any? Performance study. On two particles, no. Yeah. For, for. Ah, okay, yes. Uh, this, well, this is. Uh, I, I have on the paper here, I did not put it, because the point is that it depends from the algorithm. It depends how much computation you do compared to how much communication you do, and this is depend from. Uh, time stepping depends from which algorithm you are you are using discretization uh, no, let's say which order uh, of the derivative you use I don't know if you are more into numeric all, all these kind of things so uh, you can do for one specific problem or now unfortunately for here you know put because I didn't know which kind of audience I'm going to speak about otherwise I will say ah oh, SPH this is a particle method here, here is the scalability this I, I, I don't have, but let's say to, to scale, for example, on uh, let's say same processor, let's say you, you, you cannot do on two particles, you need under thousand, something like that, okay, to, to scale it, a processor. Every processor must have on the order of 10,000 particles in order to, to scale, otherwise. Have you thought about supporting a grid CPU like the Parallela Epiphany towards 64 Ooh. CPUs? Basically, I, I think that's cheaper than the GPU. I never try. Uh, the, the question is that I use a lot of templates, so the question is that which compiler do I have? There's a special MPI library for Epiphany, so you have to. Okay. Do, do I support MPI 3.0? That's is. Plus, uh, yeah, you see also I have a lot of dependency, boost and blah, blah, blah. And, and the question is that whenever I use all this hardware, does this thing compile in there? Is 
something that I have to try. So I, I actually don't know. I, I don't have much. If, if, yeah, actually, we have a parallel board. <laughs> 16 or it was an epix uh, it was very old it has been bought three four years ago hmm? no one ever used it i just <laughs> it looked perfect for this board it look yeah if everything is yeah let's say i'm i'm not super expert so <laughs> on this kind of computational paradigm but I know that it is an array of yeah. CPUs. <coughs> and it costs, there's zero cost from one core to the next core, the MPI. Mm -hmm. is, is but very... it's costly if you go somewhere else, but because the, the particles just cross one border, okay. it's very cheap to communicate with people from there. Mm. Probably the, maybe the problem would be if you have like a simulation more adaptive than the because I don't know if you want to map this processor in a space way or because the question is how, how it map. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. 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 The question would be how I map the 3D problem or 2D. Uh, that, that would be. I know that, for example, also people wanted to do this uh, 3D array of CPU that. But but is I'm not super into it. But it's an interesting. Let's say the the the, the market of the accelerator is going quite rapidly into several directions. The question is that which will be the next things is difficult to. I thought that they're they're dying after one or two years. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yes. That's also the difficulty and say, let's support this one, then it dies. You know? So for now, in fact, what I support is that for, uh, for communication, I use MPI, and that is the standard in HPC, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for, for GPU, is just CUDA. Uh, I, I don't even consider OpenCL. I mean, not a bad OpenCL, but uh, let's say, I know that you have only NVIDIA, but let's say on Cluster NVIDIA is is the, the the big guy. Let's say I don't see many AMD GPUs cluster. Yes, uh, no problem. Yes, it's for shared and also distributed. Let's say all the one that I show can go on shared and on distributed and you don't have to change code based on this abstraction all of them work on shared or distributed without change of the code thanks again